Good evening. I'd like to call the City Council meeting of Monday, November 1st uh, to order. If I can have our City Clerk please call the roll. Mayor Flores. Present. Deputy Mayor Tharp. Present. Councilmember Noble. Here. Councilmember Dugo. Here. Councilmember Pierce. Here. Councilmember Busquets is absent. Mayor, we have a quorum. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Right. Um, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion. Second. All right. A motion made by Council Member Dugo, second by Deputy Mayor Tharp. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That motion carries 4 0. Moving on to comments from the public for agenda items only. Anyone wishing to speak on any agenda item, please come forward. State your name and address for the record. All right, seeing no one, uh, we are moving on to special business. Tonight we have uh, a guest. We have uh, President uh, Ava Parker from Palm Beach State College who's going to be uh, addressing the council and the community. We're, uh, we've been looking forward to this, President Parker. So uh, come on up. I've been with the college now for a little over six years and certainly I've had the opportunity to speak with some of you individually during my time here, but this is my first opportunity to speak with you collectively. So I want to say thank you so much um, for, for this um, chance to be a part of your agenda for this evening and talk to you a little bit about the college and um, our relationship and I'm hoping uh, we can discover ways to strengthen the partnership to, um, for the betterment of our community. Um, you can see that often I start these conversations by saying that, you know, by showing a heart because I feel like the college is really the heart of Palm Beach County. I tell folks all the time that anytime you go outside of your regular neighborhood, you're going to come in contact with someone who took a class, someone who was trained, uh, someone who actually earned a credential or a um, actual you know, degree from Palm Beach State College. Because about 75 to 76 percent of our students who graduate, they actually um, tend to stay in Palm Beach County. And I always say that we're like the infrastructure. We're the ones that provide the economic development and the support for our business community. So from there, I say we're the heart of Palm Beach County. Um, just to give you some idea, uh, we are the oldest public college in the state of Florida. Uh, we were established in 1933. We're just about to celebrate 90 years. Um, we have five different campuses. We serve about 45,000 uh, 45, students. You know, I tell folks all the time that if you want to know about kind of what's happening in the county, take a look at uh, Palm Beach State because we're about a third black, a third white, and a third Hispanic, and that's much of what I see happening throughout the county. Um, we offer associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, as well as certificate programs. And one of the signature things that we have that really make a difference for so many of our families is that we also participate strongly in dual enrollment, which allows our high school students and now even our middle school students, according to statute, to actually start taking college-level courses while they're still enrolled in middle and high school. And as I said earlier, we are, um, I think, the economic heartbeat of Palm Beach County because part of my job as president is not just to take care of our, our students and not just to take care of our families, but also to take care of our businesses and our, and our municipalities to ensure that we're graduating folks that you want to hire. Um, so it's my job to listen and make sure the programs are responding to the concerns that you have as leaders of your community and your businesses as well as, your, as, well as in your capacity as political leaders. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about our local impact. So we're the largest provider of higher education in Palm Beach County. So while we have other institutions, you know, with our five different locations, we actually serve more students um, in, at Palm Beach State than our other academic higher education institutions. We have a $1.1 billion annual economic impact on the county. 
And uh, we are the primary provider of public safety training, as I talked to your police chief here today. Uh, we're also the primary provider of health care workers. You can know that we are a community of hospitals, and so many of them need nurses and EMT and um, folks to support, the, to, um, to support those um, medical programs, and we train those folks. And for every local high school graduate, about 50% of them attend Palm Beach State College. So for those um, high school students who choose to earn some type of credential post high school, about 50% of them choose to come to Palm Beach State. I thought you might be interested in how we've dealt with COVID-19. I know that's something that's on the mind of many, particular as municipal or as a, as a municipality in our community. Um, so we did receive about $131 million in HERF or CARES federal, uh, federal funds. So with those resources, we were able to update technology in classroom spaces. Um, we had to provide air filtration throughout the life of the college. Um, we actually provided students who were um, actually coming to college during that time $1,000 um, per student once they enrolled in classes. And really the idea was that um, not just here, but actually throughout the country, so many students have been lost. Um, they never came back to college, you know, once the pandemic set in. And so we've been trying to find ways to meet their needs, assuming that some of their concerns might be financial. And so one way was to say that in addition to whatever financial aid or support you would normally see, would also give you an additional $1,000 to meet whatever con um, concerns or demands that you have or unmet needs that you have because of the pandemic. This also was available for our dual enrollment students. That is that if they enrolled in classes with us, we would also share those resources with them. Of course, we uh, purchased laptops because not all of our students were able to attend classes once we went remote. And so we had to find ways to ensure they stayed connected. And so that's why we provided laptops as well as hotspots in those communities where there were no, or in those families where there was no internet access. And we were really um, kind of uh, forward thinking in that we partnered with the healthcare district of Palm Beach County to provide COVID testing as well as vaccinations on campus. Um, we now offer testing on all five of our campus, um, eight to five, all five of our campuses from eight to five every day. And what we've done is that we've kind of learned that since the pandemic, there were some things that were positive from that experience. You know, I tell folks all the time, um, when I think about a student who lives in Belle Glade, who potentially wants to take a higher level math class that's only offered in Boca, because of transportation constraints, he wouldn't have that opportunity. But during the pandemic, we learned that there was a way to offer that class remotely so that student would have just greater access to choices because I wouldn't be able to offer that class if I didn't have enough students who were interested out in his community. So from that, we've learned that it's important for us to provide options for our students because about 80% of our students work and they go to school, uh, which I think is so special because we have folks who are so committed to like ensuring that they can continue to meet their, um, their academic needs as well as their financial needs and have a special grit to pull that all together. But what we found is that we would offer in-person classes for those students who still wanted to come back to school and go face-to-face. -face. Um, we then started offering live online, which is just like a, a Zoom class or a Teams class that a student could be wherever they wanted to be, but it would come at a very specific time that they would have to get in front of their computer and meet with their professor. We offer fully online as well as hybrid courses. And the idea was that we were trying to balance it so that based upon the specific needs of our students, they would find a modality that worked for them and they would come back to college. And we found that to be very successful, particularly as we started the fall semester. Um, one thing that we also learned is that it was important for us to be a real important partner to our hospitals. So when they ran low on ventilators, you know, we have a cardiovascular program, so we had let them borrow our ventilators. When they were low on PPE, we had PPE that we had available for our healthcare students, and we had let them, you know, have that PPE. So we really were very much a big support for our healthcare industry during this particular, I mean, during the pandemic. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about kind of really how I see or how, what I'm hoping our, par our partnership can look like. You know, it's our goal to develop a partnership between the city of Green Acres and the college that targets training and academic opportunities for your residents. You know, it's important to us that, um, that we find ways to support the people that you care about as municipal leaders. And we want you to know that we're not just like a neighbor that's down the street, but we can be a neighbor close up if that's what makes more sense for you and your constituents. 
there's some work that's been done by the Florida Chamber. And what they've done is that they've taken a look at zip codes throughout the state of Florida. And maybe you've heard um, the gentleman that's from the, found, from the foundation. Uh, he's an economist. And what they've done is they've kind of taken a look at zip codes all throughout the, uh, the state to try to determine where it is that we have um, a, a lower poverty rate. And they do this based upon the number of children who are under the age of 18 in a particular zip code. And so what they've done is if you look at the top number, if you say take the first one three, under 33413, so that top number is the zip code itself. And then the middle number is the number of kids who are in poverty living within that zip code. And then the bottom number is basically the percentage that are under 18 and actually, um, and actually living in poverty. And so what we've done is that we've taken a look at the zip codes that we have within Green Acres. And again, this is just based upon the work that was done by the Florida Chamber. And they've, we've identified these four specific zip codes where there's a concern um, about the poverty rate for children who live in those zip codes and want to know that we want to do our part to help target those zip codes to you know, provide training for the families or um, whatever we can do with the children in those areas. But know that these are areas of great concern for you and want to know that we want to be a part of the solution as you think through ways to um, further support your residents. Um, we took a look at some of the indus industries, and I know this is no secret to you, but just in our independent research, these are the types of industries that we um, see that are located in those poverty zip codes that we just previously identified. So we know that there are child daycare services, there's, there are diagnostic imaging centers, um, ambulatory health care, assisted living facilities, um, there are law lawyers and dentists and doctors, um, software publishers and tax prep and accounting services. So when we look at the actual industries that exist in the previous zip codes that we identified, we were thinking through ways that we might be able to find folks who are ready to be hired and support those particular industries. Um, and then what we did is we kind of overlaid some of the programs that we have that we think um, are available uh, for your residents that specifically match up with those industries. So I know that you know, most, of, most, mo most folks know that we are a public college and that many of our students come to us because they want to earn an AA and transfer to a university. But we also specialize in short-term training. That is, these are certificate programs that are more focused on short-term training and put a person right into a job or right into a profession. And so we have these um, career credit certificates that are business specialists, accounting technology, computer science, dental assisting and hygiene and medical sonography, paralegal, marketing operations, youth development. These are all shorter term programs that we think might match up to the, um, the local business needs that you have right here in Green Acres based upon our research. And just wanted you to be aware of these workforce type programs that we have available that maybe um, would be of interest to your residents. And then we also have something that we call uh, a 24, um, 24 rapid credentialing programs that definitely provide training and support in less than one year. And this, I show, I show you this list because the other one that kind of specifically matched up with the businesses that we research within Green Acres and the poverty zip codes, this is a general idea of some short-term programming that we have that may be of interest to your residents. And so what we've done is that we've actually partnered with different municipalities where we said, you know, we are willing to come to a, a space that you designate if you'd like, if you think that's easier if you would help us in identifying residents who you think may be of interest in participating in some of these programs. And it may be that you say, well, gosh, since there's a lot of accounting, is, there, is it possible for us to offer this career credit certificate um, within accounting within any location that you guys might identify? And I could say, well, certainly we can bring a professor over, we can bring academic advisors over, we can help people to register if you would help us to identify folks if there's an interest that you might have in a particular area. And um, what's interesting about that is that when we um, develop this partnership, we also bring career source to the table. So in many instances, people qualify for financial aid and they have no idea just because they've never completed the FAFSA to know. 
And um, so we would actually have an academic advisor who could talk to a potential student, help them complete the FAFSA, but then also bring career source to the table and they could help them with scholarship dollars. So that really is something that is low to no cost to the student. And also we're hoping at a place and location that's convenient for them. And we're hoping that in turn they can actually partner with some of the businesses that may need employees in within this particular community. So we see this as a win for the community because we're willing to come to the students or, and come to your residents, a win for the city and that I know that you care about ensuring that these folks have an opportunity for not just a job but even a better job if they like. And then certainly a win for us because it's a way for us to be a better service to our constituents here within the county. When we talk a little bit specifically about student benefits is that um, you know, for these short-term programs is that the time to completion is, in some instances, less than 16 weeks. Um, the rapid credentialing prepares individuals for um, high-demand, high-wage careers in a year or less. It's a great avenue for those who haven't attended classes in a while. I know that sometimes when we bring adults back to the table, it's been a while. And again, this is not something that's just for an older adult. It can be someone that's just right out of college. Again, someone we're hoping within your community. Um, we can offer at a location that's off campus um, within the Green Acres area, uh, wherever you guys would identify. I can tell you that when we did something similar to this with the city of Riviera Beach, they actually identified a conference room within their um, governmental complex that we used as a place for classes. Um, in that instance, they actually said if you guys would complete the program, they would actually assist them in finding jobs, um, which was really cool. Um, we've been having conversations with, say, the city of Wellington and that they're having a hard time finding people to work in their water, um, I guess, in their water area. And so we're saying that in this sense, if you would come in and help us to train folks, then we can go ahead and develop our pipeline because that's a place where it's hard for us to find employees and we think that it's a good career path. Um, and those are just examples of different things that we have um, kind of tried to think about outside the box that really makes sense for our municipalities as, a, again, as you continue to serve your community. Um, we try to create a pathway. That is that if we can get a person started, we try to give them something that can lead to additional opportunity if they're interested. So a pathway to an associate of science degree or associates in arts or even a baccalaureate degree or baccalaureate degree um, is was um, through something that we call stackable credentials. That is that once you earn this CCC, it could also lead to like you take a few more classes and you earn your AA or your AS. And then also that can prepare you for a bachelor's program as well. Um, we think it provides promotability and marketability and certainly we provide career planning services as well. We think that there's benefits to a partnership like this, and in some ways, Mr. Mayor, I feel like you can really do this part of the presentation for me instead of me doing it myself. <laughs> but we think there are benefits to a partnership program like this because it, it increases access to higher education, and it creates an opportunity for employment growth throughout the enhancement of job skills, credential offerings from residents um, of, of Green Acres. Uh, we think it strengthens community relationships um, with our industry partners, uh, cultivates and grows the city workforce if that's something that's important and, and you have a need for, encourages participation across all business sectors, and identifies potential cohort and target populations that would benefit from workforce training, including internship opportunities for our students, and really helps to quickly retool those who have become unemployed due to the pandemic. You know, what we find is that so many people have kind of stopped out or they've made, um, kind of decided they have a different interest. Uh, based upon their experience with the pandemic. And so we're looking to be a resource for those individuals who are rethinking their career choices, um, looking for maybe a better way to earn a living that may be more conducive for their new lifestyle. Uh, we think that we are a revenue or an access point for them and looking for ways to reach out to them and know that we're here and available to help. Um, one thing you'll hear me say is that at the college we inspire hope. Uh, we advance skills and we transform lives. And I say we inspire hope because so many of our students are the first person in their family to go to college and they have no idea they can be successful. And so we really speak with them and let them know this is an avenue, this is possible for you. It doesn't matter if you never tried it before. Uh, we advance skills because it's so important that we ensure our students can do the job. 
you know, because our students stay here, it's almost like, you know, ensuring that you're seeing the people that you train all the time. And you want to feel comfortable that when you see them, when you're in a dentist chair and they're supporting your dentist, um, that you know they've received excellent training and you're so comfortable with the services that you're about to receive. And ultimately, we transform lives. And it's not just the lives of our students, but it's the lives of their families. And we think that this thing that we say can go even further with a partnership or a greater partnership um, with Green Acres. So with that, I say thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, it certainly is a pleasure for me to, to see you and know that we're very serious about our commitment to you as well as our commitment to your community and your residents. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Are uh, there any comments, questions from the council? Yeah. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, I, I actually worked at Palm Beach State College for uh, a number of years, and, and I've seen firsthand the, the quality of um, education that you can get at Palm Beach State College at a very affordable uh, uh, price. I think, to be honest with you, I think it's a steal. Um, and, and I'm very much looking forward to partnering with, with um, Palm Beach State College uh, in some way. I think we need to find what is the right uh, area, I guess, uh, I guess that, that concentration. What, I'm, what I've been hearing a lot lately is daycares, that they're missing qualified people in that area. Uh, a lot of parents, um, moms have been staying home. Um, because they can't find daycare. So I don't know. I, I know we have our, our center who provides quality uh, service to our residents, but I've heard from a lot of business owners out there that they can't, they can't find qualified people to staff certain grades or uh, age groups. Right. I don't know if that's something that we, we can focus on. I don't know what our availability is, but I'm going to hopefully leave it back on, on uh, our city manager's hands. Absolutely. And we'll be in touch, and we'll, we'll come up with a plan. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. And um, I would tell you that um, early child care training is something that, um, that we do. And I can tell you that it's very interesting because the conversation in Tallahassee is about, you know, workforce, 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 and they really want us to um, ensure that we're training um, in areas that provide um, this high demand, high wage occupations. And certainly we have a commitment to that, but we also have a commitment to ensure that we have great people to staff our early learning facilities and daycares. Um, and while it may not pay the same wage as you get whenever you're a welder or if you're going to go into an IT profession, um, we think that the work that they do is very, very important. And so we put a lot of time into ensuring that we have qualified graduates in that area as well. And generally people go into that because they have a heart for that kind of work. So just know that that is something that we have an interest in. Um, also know that we have things like if you have people who want to engage, we have a grant that um, we can get a laptop to them, get them internet connectivity. Is that something that's going to slow them down? We have access to that. Um, we try to make this as, as easy as possible for people who want to use this as an opportunity to, um, to really retool and, um, and change their careers. So the hardest part for us is just kind of connecting to the people. And so that's where I think that, you know, we can come together and, and even, um, you know, as we talk um, to the city manager, even if it's not that we can develop a cohort that is, you know, 20 people who want to do the same thing, it may be that we can identify different people that we can engage in courses and give them the tools to attend in a way that's most convenient for them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're thinking. Absolutely. Great. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Parker. No, no, thank for you your so time. much. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity. Much. Such a pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, moving on to our consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion made by Deputy Mayor Tharp, second by Councilmember Noble. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That motion carries for zero. All right, moving on to our regular agenda. Uh, we have Ordinance 2021-14. Uh, we have a first reading. If I can have our city clerk please uh, read the ordinance by title. 
Ordinance 2021-14, first reading, amending the comprehensive plan more specifically to adopt a property rights element in its entirety as contained herein, providing for repeal of conflicting ordinances, providing for severability, providing for transmittal to the Department of Economic Opportunity, providing for inclusion in the comprehensive plan, and providing for an effective date. All right, and we have today Karen Garner-Young, Zoning Administrator, presenting. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Karen Gardner-Young, on behalf of the City of Green Acres, Zoning Administrator. We actually have three items uh, that are comprehensive plan amendments. They're really bookkeeping, or I should say um, housekeeping for us. The first one we have in front of us, um, the three that we have is the property rights adoption. It is a property rights element. The second one is our CIE annual update. And the third one is the water supply update. So the first item we have in front of us, because we're going to handle each one individually. So the first one is the property rights element. So during our last legislative session, the state actually adopted a requirement that each local government needs to adopt a private rights element into their comprehensive plan. And this is required to be done either prior to adoption of when you're doing a land use amendment or if uh, when we're required to do our update to our comprehensive plan. So we're actually early because we don't have any comprehensive plans right now that will be affected and our year actually isn't going to be due for at least another year. I'm trying to work this out. So <laughs> that's okay. So, um, yeah, go down. So the language is very, very broad. And it's actually, we verbatim kind of copied what was already contained within the um, within the state statute. We didn't need to create our own language. So it's very broad, although I will be honest with you that we already had property rights in existence in the, in the state of Florida. If you've ever heard of the Burt Harris Act, this actually follows through with what the Burt Harris Act wanted us to uh, follow through with. So staff's recommendation on this, it is consistent with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council Strategic Regional Policy Plan. It's also in compliance with Chapter 163 state statutes. Our land development staff um, heard this application on September 23rd, 2021, and had no objections. It also went to the local planning agency on October 20th, 2021, and they recommended its approval unanimously. And staff is recommending approval on first reading. There is a second reading that will be required later of CPA 21-04 through the adoption of Ordinance 2021-14. I'm available to answer any questions or comments you may have and ask that the file be included as part of the record. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions from the Council? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve Ordinance 2021-14 first reading. Second. I have a motion made by Council Member Pierce, second by Council Member Dugo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That motion carries 4-0. All right, moving on to Ordinance 2021-15. If I can have our city clerk, please call the uh, read the ordinance by title. Ordinance 2021-15, first reading, amending the comprehensive plan, more specifically to update the five-year capital improvement plan of the City of Green Acres as outlined in the capital improvement element as contained herein, providing for repeal of conflict new ordinances, providing for severability, providing for transmittal to the Department of Economic Opportunity, providing for inclusion in the comprehensive plan, and providing for an effective date. And once again, we have Karen Garner-Young, Zoning Administrator, presenting. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. Again, this is a comprehensive plan amendment. It is our Capital Improvements Element Annual Update. This is a requirement by state statute. The reasoning is, is there's supposed to be availability of public facilities and services to support development concurrent with the impact of such development. We accomplish this through our Capital Improvement Element and although municipalities are only required to update our capital improvement element every five years, state statute does obligate the city to update its capital project schedules, including those being funded by outside agencies. And the city of Green Acres does have some outside agencies. So in, in the air of being in compliance with this requirement, the city's level of service is maintained under the following uh, four items. We have the city of Green Acres, our capital improvement projects, which you already adopted through the budget. We also have the county and state roadway network as proposed as part of the Palm Beach County's five-year roadway program. And it does show progress, progr sorry, projects within or adjacent to the city of Green Acres. 
The third item is Palm Beach County Water Utilities Department, their water supply work plan, and that does include projects throughout their interconnected system. And lastly, we have taken Palm Beach County School Board, their five-year plan, and included it as well into our comprehensive capital improvement element. Staff has a recommendation. We took a look at what was being proposed. We feel it is in compliance with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council's Strategic Regional Policy Plan. We also feel it's in compliance with Chapter 163 of the state statutes. Land development staff did hear this application on September 23rd, 2021, and they had no objections. The local planning agency heard this application on October 20th, 2021, and recommended its approval unanimously. Staff is recommending approval on first reading of CPA 21-02 through the adoption of Ordinance 2021-15. We ask that our uh, documentation and file be included as part of the record, and I'm here to answer any questions, comments, or concerns. Is there any comments or questions from the council? Council Member Noble. I, I move that we approve Ordinance 2021-15 on first reading. Second. All right, I have a motion made by Council Member Noble, second by Council Member Dugo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, yes. That motion carries 4-0. All right, moving on to Ordinance 2021-16. If I can have our city clerk please uh, read the ordinance by title. Ordinance 2021-16, first reading, creating a new multi-purpose development review and appeals board to be called the Planning and Zoning Board of Appeals at Section 16-81 through Section 16-85 of Chapter 16 Zoning Regulations, Article 2, Administration, Division 3 of the City Code of Ordinances, repealing the existing Section 16-81 through 16-84 of Chapter 16 Zoning Regulations, Article 2, Administration, Division 3, Planning Commission, Local local planning agency and repealing the existing section 16-101 through 16-107 of chapter 16 zoning regulations article 2 administration division 4 zoning board of adjustments and appeals creating a new division 4 to be entitled variances at chapter 16 zoning regulations article 2 administration to include section 16-101 through 16-105 and creating a new administrative variance process at section 16-106 providing for related revisions throughout the city's code of ordinances to replace the existing board's name with the name of the new planning and zoning board of appeals providing for repeal of conflicting ordinances providing for separability providing for inclusion in code and providing for an effective date and we have Karen Gardner Young, Zoning Administrator Presenting. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. And by the way, Quinn, I was glad to see you were breathing during that. So, <laughs> um, this is a zoning text amendment, and um, we are asking to actually take two boards. There we go. Two boards that are going to be affected by this zoning text amendment. The first one is the Planning Council slash Local Planning Agency. And this um, board actually hears, considers, and makes recommendations on land and development activity within the city. So they see your site plans, uh, they see your, um, your comp plans. Uh, so they are seeing anything that generally affects development petitions. On the other hand, the second board that will be affected is the Zoning Board of Adjustment and Appeals. And they hear and decide appeals concerning either interpretation of the code or they hear and decide in regards to variances. And the intent of this is to create a new board. That new board then would be responsible for both the Planning Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals functions. Is it not moving? Oh, sorry. Um, I've, um, it's outlined within the text amendment. Um, we're going to, the existing boards are both seven members with two alternates. The new board we're recommending is to go to five members with two alternates and the existing board members would all be entitled to apply for that those positions on that new board it would be the same process that we have existing that the mayor would make a recommendation um, I'm also recommending thank you also recommending that we have staggered terms so if you look at the ordinances presented it has some that have three years two years one year so that way there's always somebody on the board that will have the history of the previous years, um, uh, indicating no term limits so that they could be reappointed. Uh, we're also uh, has creating a quorum, and we're reducing from two meetings a month to one meeting a month. 
Um, in regards to the variances, the changes we're talking about is we're going to clarify that variances run with the land, not with the person. We want to make a note that the burden is on the property owner in regards to prove the variance, which is more appropriate than, than, than staff. Mm -hmm. We also want to note that there's no precedence for a variance. So in other words, if one property gets a variance, it doesn't mean that somebody else automatically gets one. It's all based on a factual situation. And lastly, we are putting an ability to uh, limit the ability to refile a variance amendment for one year. So if you go in front of the, um, this new board and it's denied, you've got to wait a year before you come, can come back. Typically, circumstances and conditions don't change during that time period, so it's not unusual to have a cert certain limitation. And lastly, we're actually adding in a provision that would authorize administrative variances. And this would provide certain minor uh, situations or sections when city staff can approve a variance rather than having to go to the new board. And, um, but we're doing protections. So we're not going to say it's just a staff item. So, for example, they have to obtain letter of no objection from the surrounding property owners. So when we're opening up, we're doing a transparent, which is what all governments try to impose. We also are going to have um, the requirement to notify property owners within 300 feet of the property that this variance would be um, potentially uh, authorized. And lastly, it could be determined by the city manager that if the petition is an administrative uh, variance, but she feels or he feels that it goes beyond that authority, the city manager would then have the authority in which to change it so it would no longer be an administrative. It would have to go through the full blown, which means it would have to go to the commission, uh, to, the, um, to the new board. Now, why we're recommending this? There's a couple of reasons. First of all, it streamlines the process for all development issues. So you're not having to go in front. If you've got a variance and you've got a site plan, you have to go in front of two boards. Now you would be heard by one board, so you don't need to have two separate meetings, which could be two months apart. So we want to make sure that we're moving along at a proper pace. It also will reduce the confusion as to which board hears which issue. I always get somebody comes in and they have a petition. They never know which board they're supposed to go in front of. And so this way, again, one board, they hear the same facts. They make the same decision. It goes to the third point, which is making zoning decisions more uniform and consistent. And lastly, we go to be reducing staff time, costs, and logistics associated with two boards versus one board. The one item we didn't put in here, I did put in the staff report, is we have had some trouble getting a quorum for some of the boards. So by combining the two board, you know, by eliminating the two boards and creating a brand new one, we now will have people sufficient number to handle and should be able to get the quorum as we need to. We did take a look at the zoning uh, text amendment proposed. We feel it's inconsistent with the city's comprehensive plan. We also feel it furthers the purpose of the city's zoning code. So staff's recommendation. The land development staff heard this application on September 23, 2021 and had no objections. The planning commission heard this application on October 20th, 2021 and recommended its approval unanimously. And staff is recommending approval on first reading of ZTA 2101 through the adoption of ordinance 2021-16. And I ask that all the items, the materials in the file be included as part of the record and I'm here to answer any questions, comments or concerns you may have. Um, are there any comments or question? Deputy Mayor Tharp. Uh, question for you. Going back to the 300 foot um, boundary or notification radius, there are certain projects that, that we've impact people beyond that 300 feet. And I know it's a cost, I know everything, but I, I'm going to bring up the, the cell tower that we put in the back of this property. Even though Nautica West was not within that 300 foot, it's a direct line of sight. It's so I, I don't know if there's anything we can do with if there's a certain height. I, I mean, I, I'm probably being really nitpicky, so I apologize. Um, but the height of a project might increase the distance of the the radius. I don't know if there's any any other communities doing that, but it'd be something that I'd be definitely interested in, in learning more about. Uh, Councilmember Dugo. Uh, okay. Personally, I think this is one of the best ordinances that's come before me. And, and um, I don't know, my comment is when in the case of a cell tower, no matter 
what the radius is, you're going to see it. After a while, hopefully, it just becomes oblivious like anything. Correct, but it, the, the taller the object, the, the further the radius okay, I see. is my only... Okay. And I'm not saying that you know it, it needs to be modified. I think it's something that I'd, I'd like to see what other municipalities do, okay. if anything. I'm going to make a motion to approve 2021-16. I'll second uh, it. Yeah. I have a motion made by Council Member Dugo, second by Deputy Mayor Tharp. Are there any other comments or questions from the Council? Seeing none, do I have a motion? I mean, do, <laughs> I already have a motion. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that motion carries. Uh, Mr. Tharp, I mean, Pierce? Yes. That motion carries 4-0. All right, we are now moving on to a public hearing for Ordinance 2021-17. If I can have the city clerk please call the or uh, read the ordinance by title. Ordinance 2021-17, first reading and amending the comprehensive plan, more specifically to update the City of Green Acres 10-year water supply facilities work plan as adopted by reference in the intergovernmental and public facilities elements as contained herein, providing for repeal of conflicting ordinances, providing for severability, providing for transmittal to the Department of Economic Opportunity, providing for inclusion in the comprehensive plan, and providing for an effective date. And if you're keeping score at home, this is a public hearing. I know it's on the uh, so. on the agenda. It does not dictate that, but it is a public hearing. Uh, we have uh, once again uh, Karen Gardner Young, zoning administrator, presenting. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, City Council. Uh, as stated, this is our water supply element update, and this is required because the um, South Florida Water Management District updated their water supply facilities work plan. And once they update theirs, we're required within 18 months in order to update ours. Now, it's a little weird for the city of Green Acres because we don't supply potable water. So it's really Palm Beach County that has to adopt the, the water supply plan, and then we adopt their plans because we don't fund, we don't maintain. So we really need to rely upon them. So this is really a proposed amendment to the plan. It is in accordance with the Palm Beach County Water Supply Facilities Work Plan. It's also in compliance with the South Florida Water Management District policy and plan. Now, again, Palm Beach County Water Utilities is the provider of potable water to the city of Green Acres. The intention of this ordinance was to ensure that the cities and the water supply, as well as South Florida Water Management Districts, all coordinate together in regards to water resources because it is a limited um, element that we have. And so by coordinating all the parties together, we make sure that everybody's on the same wavelength and we're uh, coordinating the water supply planning and development decisions to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our residents today and for tomorrow as well. Uh, based on the plan that we have here, that's showing that we have necessary potable water available for the residents of Green Acres, at least through 2025, and that would include supporting any projected growth that we would have, particularly in the area. Staff has uh, reviewed what is being presented to you today. Uh, we believe it's in compliance with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council Strategic Regional Policy Plan, as well as Chapter 163 under Florida statutes. The land development staff heard this application on September 23, 2021, and had no objections. The local planning agency heard this application on October 20th, 2021, and recommended its approval unanimously. And staff is recommending approval on first reading of CPA 2103 through the adoption of Ordinance 2021-17. We ask that all our records be included as part of the uh, rec uh, file, and I'm here to answer any questions, concerns, or comments you may have. Are there any comments or questions from the council? All right, at this time, I'd like to open public hearing for Ordinance 2021-17. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the ordinance, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition of the ordinance, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Seeing none, public hearing is now closed. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve Ordinance 2021-17, first reading. Second. All right, I have a motion made by Council Member Pierce, second by Council Member Noble. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, that motion carries 4 0. All right, moving on to our discussion item. Item 13 Property Improvement Program Criteria. Uh, we have technically is scheduled to have uh, Director Carlos Cedeno and Eileen Hernandez, Administrative Assistant. Um, 
presenting. Unfortunately, they are uh, not here with us today. Uh, we're going to defer. I'm sorry. Let's do it next time. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is um, Can we m just make a motion to, to pull it? And put it next meeting. That's fine. We can do yeah, that. Right, sure. Let's, let's pull it. Let's uh, have that discussion next meeting, and then Council Member Busquet will also be here. All right. Uh, moving on to comments from the public uh, for non-agenda items. Anyone wishing to speak, please come forward. State your name and address for the record. Don't everybody get up at once? Um, <laughs> all right. So we're moving on to our city manager's report. Uh, city manager McHugh. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the November 15th council meeting, we don't currently have any items for that agenda, so uh, requesting to cancel that meeting, we can put uh, the discussion item for this evening with the items for the December 6th meeting if the council is okay with that. Okay. Um, I think we have consensus across the board. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, uh, in addition, just a few reminders, uh, November the 11th, we do have our Veterans Day uh, event here at City Hall at 9 a.m. Uh, November the 17th, we have our next in the series, our Let's Talk series regarding trauma-informed care, uh, 6.30 p.m. at the Community Center. I can't stress enough how valuable these, these uh, um, sessions are. If you have an opportunity to attend them, the subject matter experts that are community and recreation staff have brought in for these topics have just been outstanding. So they are definitely worth the hour and a half of your time and, and the time goes so quickly because you're really getting a lot of really great information. So uh, November the 17th, 6.30 p.m. at the Community Center and this month's topic is trauma-informed care. Uh, and then also just as a reminder, uh, the city is still doing COVID testing at the Community Center Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, and that is it. Just wishing everyone a safe and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, City Manager McHugh. Are there any comments or questions for City Manager? All right, seeing none. Um, moving on to our uh, City Attorney uh, report, City Attorney Torsivia. Uh, you may already be aware that the Florida Supreme Court decided a case a few weeks ago involving the City of West Palm Beach where a neighbor was complaining that the city was not enforcing the codes against that person's neighbor. and. Uh, person who was complaining uh, sued the city and said you have an obligation to enforce your codes and the Supreme Court said no you don't. The um, city has the discretion as to how you enforce codes. So um, just a reminder that's basically been the state of the law for years but this is a, a more recent case that reiterates that principle that yes while the city uh, you know obviously has the right to enforce their codes the manner and how many resources you put into that and how you assign is strictly discretionary within the city. Thank you. That's good to know. Uh, is there any comments or questions from the council? All right. Thank you, City Attorney Tercivia. Moving on to the mayor's and city council report. I believe I started to my right last time, so I'm going to start to my left. Um, council Member Pierce. Uh, none. Council Member Dugo. None, thank you. Council Member Noble. Nothing, please. Nothing. Uh, Deputy Mayor Tharp. Uh, no report. And as for the mayor's report, um, I'm, I'm starting to get back out into the community. I'm, I'm wearing my mask. Um, I had the pleasure of going and reading to Kingswood Academy uh, last Thursday. Was it Thursday? And it was nice to see the kids again. It was nice to get back out. Um, everybody was wearing a mask. Um, but man, we might, we might be coming out of this here shortly. So, um, I know it's been a long year and I know our, our, our kids and a lot of our partners in the community are, are starting to, uh, do some events and it, it feels like we're, we're starting to, to get back to normal and, and I'm looking forward to that. I know a lot of people in the community are too. Just want to remind everybody to be careful. Don't put, don't let your guard down. I know it's easy to take your mask off and take a picture or whatever or not, but at all times try to try to be safe. Um, if you can get your your vaccines, make sure you get those booster shots. Keep your family safe. Uh, take all the precautions possible. Um, that's all. Oh, and this is pretty neat. On Saturday, we had a group of uh, children go and visit our firefighter, and um, they actually uh, prayed for the. They did a quick prayer for them, and they gave them donuts and uh, orange juice, bagels, 
So it was just a nice little token of appreciation, and the firefighters did an amazing job showing them the truck, what they do. Um, it was just nice. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, it, it feels like things are, are getting a little bit back to normal. So just be safe. With that being say it, uh, said, we'll have a motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. All right, meetings adjourned. Thank you.